In this video, we'll talk about Vibrio cholerae and cholera. So, Vibrio cholerae is the causative organism behind cholera. And let's talk about the general characteristics of Vibrio cholerae. It's a gram-negative comma-shaped bacterium that you can see here. And it's gram-negative and its cell wall doesn't retain crystal violet and instead gets stained with saffronine. It is motile due to its single polar flagellum and it is oxidase positive. It is a facultative anaerobe. And the Vibrio cholerae looks exactly like a comma in a gram stain when a pathologist sees it uh, under the microscope. So the transmission happens via fecal to oral route. It can also happen via contaminated food or water, especially seafoods, which are not properly cooked. And this is endemic in the region of poor sanitization, especially relevant for third world countries. Now let's talk about the pathogenesis. Vibrio cholerae invade the lining of the small intestine and basically it has a AB toxin that does all the job. So let's talk about how the cholera toxin can affect our intestine. So in the small intestine, there are specific epithelial cells which are lining the epithelial lumen or the uh, intestinal lumen. So here are a lot of Vibrio cholerae which has entered the alimentary canal. And now these Vibrio cholerae can secrete exotoxins. That means it can secrete these toxins and these toxins can actually bind to specific receptors present on these epithelial cells. These AB toxins bind to the specific GM1 receptors present in these in intestinal cells. Now the B portion of the toxin allow that particular toxin to bind to the GM1 receptor. And after the binding what happens? There is a receptor mediated endocytosis which takes up the toxin inside the intestinal cells. And let us zoom into a cell to understand what happens after that. Then the A part of the toxin gets eventually released in the cytoplasm and that modify the G protein coupled receptor responses. So, G, so let us try to understand what is GPCR. So G protein coupled receptors are specific receptors which upon binding the ligand activates a trimeric G protein. So the G alpha subunit gets activated and the GTP bound subunit further activates adenylate cyclase which produce cyclic AMP. Now it has two configuration, an off configuration and on configuration. In the off configuration it is bound to GDP whereas in the active configuration it is bound to GTP. And after a while it switch back to the off configuration once get activated. Now this activation and inactivation happens via specific mechanisms. So GTPase activator protein basically chop off the extra phosphate group and convert it into GDP. Whereas guanosine nucleotide exchange factor do the other way around. It activates these protein. Now what cholera toxin does is it ADP ribosylates the G alpha subunit. Now as a result of this ADP ribosylation, it is locked in a GTP bound active configuration. Now, since it is locked in this configuration, adenylate cyclase is active for a prolonged duration. It's constitutively active, producing a lot and lot of cyclic AMP. Now, cyclic AMP can bind to specific channels, which are known as cyclic AMP gated channels. One such is basically CFTR. CFTR is kind of like a chloride channel. It allows chloride to get out to the intestinal lumen. So lot and lot of chloride ion leaks into the intestinal lumen and water actually follows them to maintain the osmolar balance. So lot of water is lost through the intestine. So basically water loss is a big thing in cholera. So profuse watery diarrhea often described as a rice water stool is basically characteristic finding of cholera. So this pale milky appearance of stool has flecks of mucus as well. And basically one can literally produce up to one liter of fluid loss per hour. Now alongside that there would be vomiting without any nausea, leg cramps because severe dehydration, electrolyte imbalances, sunken eyes, dry mouth, hypotension, tachycardia, all of these things are very common. 
Now, main problem is dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. There could be hyponatremia, lack of sodium, hypokalemia, lack of potassium, etc. So overall, there could be a situation like metabolic acidosis. There could be heavy kusmal breathing. Now, the treatment option is simple. Rehydrate and treat with antibiotic because it's a bacterial disease. There are several antibiotics that can be possibly used like doxycycline, azithromycin, tetracycline, ciprofloxacin, etc. But one must thing that can prevent all this damage is the oral rehydration solution or ORS. Because a huge amount of fluid is lost in case of the cholera infection. That's why one has to replenish that fluid from outside and do it in an efficient way. In case of severe situation, one has to be admitted to the hospital and given uh, should be given fluid in, in terms of IV. And it's not a fatal disease anymore, but it's highly manageable. But still, sometimes dehydration can cause a lot of problem in terms of cholera. So I hope this video was useful. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Get to our Facebook page or Instagram page to get more notes. Please support us using Super Thanks. See you in the next video.